Hi, this is Daniela Cambone and welcome back to the Daniela Cambone show now on ITM trading. For those of you who found me, I'm very happy. Thank you for continuing to, to follow me on this incredible journey. And please uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and to DanielaCambone.com so you stay on top of all this content. But for now, I can't wait to bring on uh, my next guest who is really a sound money advocate, so in line with the principles of this show. So please welcome uh, Lawrence Lepard. He is the managing partner over at Equity Management Associates. Lawrence, so good to see you. Welcome. Welcome to, to the new you. show. Yeah, good to see you as well. Congrats on the move, Daniela. Congrats on your twins turning three. And it's nice to talk to you again. It's been a little bit, little bit of time. So been, I was very, thrilled. I was thrilled when you reached out and said, "Hey, course. let's do the show." Yeah, so of course, and I want to say, yeah, they, they're three, and I'm, I'm still here. I'm, I'm still surviving one. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just hone in on one tweet, just so folks new to you here, maybe at this channel, know exactly what they're dealing with. This is just one tweet I love of yours. You oh said, "Quote: The Fed has ruined this country." This explains my passion for sound money and my anger at the ruling class and the Fed. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's, I, I, don't, I don't pull my punches. I mean, I'm 66 years old and I've, I've got a strong view on what's broken and I have a hard time being quiet about it. it. It really pisses me off. You know, we're all dealing with it and it sucks. Well, I love the passion and I really want you to help me explain everything happening in the treasuries market. Now, <laughs> Our Lynette Zhang did a deep dive in, in, into treasuries this week, and I and urge everyone to watch that, that video. But, you know, just this Thursday morning, uh, Lawrence, I see a news item with, uh, on Reuters, um, you know, explaining that it's, it's a comeback for treasuries. So not long ago, the market was collapsing so fast, going by some headlines, civilization, as, you know, as we know, it was under threat, says this Reuters article. Now they say with some encouraging hints from Fed officials, 10-year notes are poised to celebrate their best month since 08's global crash with yields down 61 basis points for November so far. But I'm thinking, wait a second, Lawrence. <laughs> Back in September, weren't treasuries out of fashion? So what? how did this comeback happen? Yeah. And what's like, what am I, or what are we to make of what is happening in treasuries and what are the clues? Yeah, look, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer, but I'll tell you my, my theory and people can argue with it and debate it. It appears to me, I mean, we were, they were losing control of the, of the treasury market, right? I mean, the 10 year was up through 5.0% and, uh, you know, it, we were starting to look the way that the, the British market looked in the fall of, of last year where you know the pound was falling and and uh, the uh, you know the British guilt was spiking up in interest rates and so um, that was kind of starting to happen here and it was rather amazing the way the Fed reacted to that I mean I think they had like eleven speakers out in the period of a few weeks basically saying you know we might be really close to the target on uh, on what we need to be in terms of tightening and 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 sending a strong signal that they were through that the Fed is done hiking. And that, in fact, the, the next move is likely to be cuts. And as you, if you look at the CME Treasury futures odds, you know the, the the odds are overwhelming that they are done and they are going to start cutting. At least that's what market participants are saying. And so, if we're going to have cutting of rates, and if you believe that the economy is slowing down and there's a recession coming, and I think that's becoming a little bit more of a consensus view as well. I've been saying it for six months to a year, but most people were denying it until recently. Then suddenly, there's a bid in the ten-year. And then if you add in one other factor that I think is somewhat important is I think this recent visit by China to the United States, mm. Roman is really the best at, at outlining how this has happened. I think that recent visit led to a conscious decision to try and weaken the dollar. And one of the things you notice that's happened in the last month or two is, you know, the treasuries have caught a bid. And so, you know, yields are down, as you said, 60 basis points. And, 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 but, but in turn, the dollar is off substantially in the same time frame. So, I think the Fed realized they were in trouble of having gone too far and having tightened too much. And thus they sent the signal to the market. Oh, no, no don't worry. The printer is coming. And, and, and we, we know the printer is coming. And by the way, gold has been signaling that as, as we'll talk about later, gold is bumping up right against its all old time high. And I suspect it's going to take it out here sometime in the next month or two. So yeah. that's what I see. 
Well, and very well said, uh, Lawrence, because and I want to get to your charts, because I know you've really taken a deep, deep dive, uh, you know, macroeconomic approach, you know, full approach uh, of what's really breaking the system here. Um, but I guess before we leave this Treasuries topic or maybe, you know, go more into yeah. it, I mean, how how are we going to service the debt? I mean, to your point, it, the only way to do that is to print more money. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Ask uh... Ask the Fed, um, you know, they, they, I mean, obviously, if they weaken the dollar enough, um, you know, they might make the yields here attractive, you know, in dollar terms or in their currency terms. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, they could change the regulations for the banks, you know, whatever. I mean, as, as we know, they've been shifting, you know, the funding towards the short end of the curve, um, you know, and, and drawing down on, on the reverse repo. The re money's been coming out of reverse repo and going into the short term bills. And I think, I think this is also somewhat just reflexive, Daniela. I mean, for the last 10 or 15 years, you know, the trade has been, oh, the economy's slowing down. Okay, that means inflation will come down. That means long bond rates will come down. That means you are smart to lock in a 10 or a 20 or a 30 year bond, you know, because in, low, in a lower inflation world, um, you know, getting paid, you know, four point whatever on a, on a 10 year, Will look really good if inflation's zero or if we get deflation or if inflation's one or two percent and so i think i think people kind of there's a knee-jerk reaction to we're having a recession by the long bond because right. that's what's always worked looking backwards now i would argue and this is a longer discussion which we'll have when we get into the charts i would argue that's the wrong reaction and that you know famous last words in investing right this time might be a little bit different <laughs> and, <laughs> And I just thought this was a good tidbit to add to the Treasury's drama. I know it's a separate conversation, but Bank of America uh, just fined, you know, something over twenty million dollars, basically, um, for spoofing the Treasury's U.S. Treasury. Yeah, market. yeah. No, I, I mean, look, all of these markets are manipulated. All the numbers are fake. I mean, you know, we live in a world that's just—it's nuts. I mean, it's—it's it's so. You know, if you're not if you're not frustrated and angry and and you know, yeah, don't, I mean, with this situation, then you're not paying attention because, I mean, it's like the smarter you are, the the more angry it makes you. And and you know, I'm really angry. I'm not saying I'm smart, but I tell you, I'm really angry because it's just it's just a friggin' mess. I mean, and we don't know where it's going to go, but you know, that'll there there are some solutions which I think your most of your listeners are probably aware of, and we're going to get to that as we go through the kind of the Fantastic. arguments. Fantastic. All right, so let's see the charts you've prepared for us okay. just to yeah. give so us a give little a perspective. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the first chart that I consider to be kind of the most important chart in the macro universe right now because it just it informs us about what the big picture is and why, you know, absent you know a financial collapse, um, we they will need to continue to print money and debase the currency. And um, this is what I call Stein's law: if something cannot go on forever, it will end. This chart is taken from Lynn Alden's book, um, Broken Money, which is an excellent book, by the way, I highly recommend it. And she pulled this together. And what you can see here is from 1966 to present, the blue line is total debt in the United States economy, left-hand scale, outstanding. So the total debt today is about 90 some odd trillion dollars. And the orange line is the base money that is in the system right now. And that's, you know, uh, base level money that's at, you know, M0. And what you can see is that we've continually grown debt, you know, post-1971 going off the gold standard. And when the blue line gets too far above the orange line, something breaks. And of course, the first break you see is in 2008, which was the GFC. And then you can see the Fed actions that required them to include, you know, to, to grow the base money and their balance sheet. So, and the base money, by the way, looks very similar to their balance sheet. They're almost almost equal, um, slightly, base money slightly less. but. Um, from you know under a trillion dollars to almost four trillion dollars, okay, and so so that's what they had to do to allow the system to continue, to allow the debt to continue to grow, and then they tried tightening, but we can see that that didn't particularly work very well. It worked for a few years, but of course then along came you know the repo blowout and uh, and COVID, and once again all all the while debt was growing, and then once again they had to ramp up the orange line. And that was the response to COVID with all the money printing, all the balance sheet growth and all the, the QE that, you know, that they did in the last round. And of course, now they're trying to tighten again, but notice that the blue line's not going down. Right. The blue line's going up. And so, so what this informs us is that we, you know, we don't know when, but they will absolutely positively have to print more money or they're gonna look at a debt collapse that's gonna rival the Great Depression. So that's kind of, to me, the master chart that informs 
my strategy, which is, you know, I want to be in things that they can't print. And the most natural things in my mind are silver, gold, and Bitcoin. So, so wait, before you move away from that chart, yeah. is, it a, is it a correct thesis on your end to say that our trouble started after we went off the gold standard? I believe it is. I mean, it's obviously it started quite slow. Um, and we had, you know, a little bit of a ramp up, you know, from, well, more than a little bit of ramp up in the gold price. But, we, you know, the first problem was 71 to 80 when the gold price went from 35 to 800. But then Volcker was able to tame it again. And of course, debt to GDP back then was much lower. And so high real interest rates actually got the system back under control. But then, you know, we basically became, we entered into a deflationary period. And, you know, what happened is over time, it just became easier and easier for the Fed put to allow that debt to grow. As you'll recall, in 87, we had a market crash. And that's when they, they mm -hmm. established the plunge protection team. You know, otherwise known as the government, the president's working group on financial markets. And that was Greenspan. And he basically said, look, there's a put underneath these markets. We realize that, you know, market collapses of 22 percent in a day are bad for this country. And so we're not going to let that happen anymore. And so as a result of that, you know, they basically cushioned us from downside. And, you know, it made investors both in stocks and bonds kind of come to the conclusion, party on, Garth. You know, we're good. If something bad happens, the Fed will save us. And, right. you know, sure enough, they have. Of course, the big one was 08. Um, but then the bigger one occurred in, you know, 2020. And, and there's another one coming. We don't know how long out it is. It could be a ways out. I would submit it's not that far, given how fast things are moving. But we'll get to that. So the, the fundamental problem here is that the government, the U.S. federal government is out of control in terms of its spending. I mean, in a fully employed economy, or so they say, they're right. lying a little bit about that. You know, we've got spending going up, you know, and, and, and obviously spending up and you can see it's spending went up enormously, you know, during COVID up 66 percent. Right. But of course, tax receipts went up, too, because people have more money. But you can see here in a full employment economy, we've got spending up, you know, year over year, 14 percent. And this is the troubling thing. We've got tax receipts down 7 percent because yeah. the market was down last year. And so what this means is that we're structurally running a two trillion dollar deficit every year. And that's growing. Now, imagine what happens when we have a recession, because in the last recessions of 08 and 2000, the federal spending went up between 8 and 18 percent and the federal income went down between 6 and 12 percent. So if you combine the worst of those two, it, suddenly your two trillion dollar deficit isn't two trillion anymore. It's three or four or five. And, you know, it, it gets to the point where. You, you know, the deficit, you, you get, you enter a debt spiral. Let's get to that because the next chart, I think, shows it very well. Take a look at this. Wow. Yeah. This is the interest charges on the federal interest, the federal debt today, right? I mean, look at the slope of that line. And, you know, it's 970 billion. That's more than we spend on defense. It's a big number. And so um, that's why the deficit is structurally bad and getting worse. It's the fastest growing part of the federal deficit. And you might think, OK, that's bad, but now they'll print and interest rates will come down and this will come down and right. everything, everything will be good. Well, not so fast. Let's go to part two of the story. This is the federal debt schedule, the federal debt maturity schedule. So what this shows is that, you know, we've got a large piece of our debt at 30 to 12 to nine. You're over 50 percent of your debt matures in the next three years. Let me just zoom back a minute. This chart. That is with an average interest rate of 2.7 percent, okay, on the federal debt, okay? We're doing most of the financing on a go-forward basis in the shorter end. Right now, the shorter end notes are paying 5 percent, 5 percent on the shorter stuff. So as all of this rolls over, it's going to suddenly be costing 5 percent instead of 2.7. So if we're yeah. at a if we're at a trillion dollars of interest expense at 2.7, now admittedly not all of it rolls over, but half of it does, and it's going to reset to a higher rate. You can see where I'm going with this. They're going to need to sell more bonds, which is going to put more pressure on interest rates, which is going to basically lead to a situation where they're going to have to buy those bonds themselves or reestablish QE or in invoke yield curve control, which is what they did to get out of the, you know, the debt crisis that they were in, you know, post-World War II. But the difference between now and post-World War II is back then, the demographics were great. We had a bunch of GIs coming home who wanted to buy washing machines and cars and houses. Now we got a boomer, bunch of boomers retiring who aren't buying anything. 
And so it's a it's a different country today. So the, po the point I guess I'm trying to make is that, and I'm going to the next schedule here, what you can see is, in my opinion, the Fed is done and they have to print. So the printer is going to go burr, and that's the next part. And this chart's very interesting. I'll try and make it a little bit bigger here for you. So this you're chart... saying even despite whatever they're saying in the, the last minutes we read, that doesn't seem that they have any intention of cutting anytime soon. That's what they're saying because they have to say it to try to control inflationary expectations. But remember, the Fed are habitual liars. I mean, this is a guy who said they weren't even thinking about thinking about raising rates, and then they turned around and jacked him up 500 points in a, in, a, in a record period of time. I mean, these guys lie for a living. That's what they do. You know, they're, they're out there to try and keep their broken system going and to cheat the rest of us. And, you know, that's, that's the game. And you can be sure, right now, inflation is the major problem, so he's being a tough guy. Yeah. But guess what? When the bond market goes no bid, as it almost did in March of 2020, and as it's kind of done a couple of times since then, you know, they're going to turn around and, and print. There's just no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. So assuming that's the case, this is an interesting chart. Let me just explain what this is. The blue line is the Fed funds rate. And what it shows you is, you know, coming into, should have gone back further, but coming into 2000, they knew they had a bubble and they were jacking Fed funds up. They got them up as high as 6.4% or something, 6.25%. And then, you know, then, but then the market rolled over, right? We had a, we had a dot-com crash and they rapidly cut rates and look, and the orange line is the price of gold. Look at what, look at what happened to the price of gold during that period, you know, yep. it doubled. okay. And then, okay. So then they, they, they cut rates down to 1% and they created, they, you know, the, the dot-com bubble burst, they created a housing bubble, you know, and Bernanke said that, remember, remember, you know, Greenspan and those guys going out and encouraging people to get HELOCs. I mean, it was sick. It was totally sick. And so they created an enormous housing bubble, but then they started raising rates to deal with that, right? And then that broke in 2008, and bang, they took rates back down to zero, okay? And, and, and of course, look at what happened to the price of gold following that, okay? And then, but then, you know, then they, they printed QE, and, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, how come there's no inflation with QE? It's, well, it's because it was really an asset swap, and the money they printed went into the, the everything bubble, which were stocks and bonds and and not into the stuff bubble, not into food and so forth. And so as a result, they had low printed inflation, but high asset inflation during this period. And of course, the gold people got hammered, including me. This is like one of the toughest periods of my life, but it is what it is. You know, good news is I got so pissed off, I got in shape because I decided I want to be around for the final round with these assholes. And so I, you know, I better get in good shape. That's what got me into CrossFit. CrossFit. So there was a, yeah. yeah, there was a, there was a silver lining to this, even though I watched my net worth go down by 50%. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. But um, but here we go. You know, now we're in 2016, and sure enough, they start raising rates again. Well, how did that work out? Up, oh, you know, repo crisis, COVID, bam, back down to zero, and gold takes off. Okay, so here we are. Now we're up, and this should be up over 5.25. I think it's a little out of date. But the point is, if if they if I'm correct, and the signaling they've been giving us is correct at 5.25. What's going to happen next? We know they're going to cut rates. What's going to happen to gold? It's going to rocket. It's going to go through 2000. It's not going to look back. So we just, I stand on the shoulders of better macro analysts than myself. And one of them is Tavi Costa. Uh huh. We uh, love Tavi. Yes. He's a, great, he's a fabulous analyst. His, his charts are just without peer. And he does a really nice job here in this chart of kind of showing the history of the gold cycles. And you can see the one from 70 to 80. And then you can see the deflationary period to 2000. Then you can see the 2000, you know, they got activists in 1998 when they bailed out LTCM and then Greenspan printed a lot of money in 2000. Remember the year 2000 problem and how the Fed jacked up their money printing during that period? That's part of what led to this. And that was the great run that we all had from 2000 to 2013. Gold went from 250 to 1900, right? And then, of course, you know, they, um, gold, they, they attacked gold and, and the economy picked back up. And so people cycled their money into stocks and stocks and bonds took off and, and gold stumbled for a while. But I love this comment by Tavi down here at the bottom. He says, we have a trifecta, trifecta of macro imbalances. We have the debt problem of the 1940s, meaning debt, government debt is 130% of GDP. We have the inflationary issues of the 1970s because we, we just had 9% CPI prints, which was very similar to the first round of inflation in the 70s. And we have the asset valuation imbalances of the 20s and 90s, 
which is to say we've got stocks at record highs, we have bonds at record highs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, in my opinion, the, bu the biggest bubble, the everything bubble that we're talking about peaked in December of 2021. And as you'll recall, 2021 and 2022, or 2020, I'm sorry, 2022 was one of the worst years ever for both stocks and bonds. I mean, there hadn't been many years where both of them fell. You know, the 60-40 portfolio performed worse in that year than it had for 30 or 40 years. And, and the reason for that is that the bubble burst. And, and the thing that's amazing to me now is everyone thinks, okay, that's it, it's all over. We're gonna have a soft landing. Inflation's gonna go back to low numbers. It really wasn't a bubble. And that's where I think anybody who's, you know, and a lot of people I know who are investors, professional investors, have only been in the market since 08 or a tad before that. And, you know, I started investing in, in, the, in the 70s and, and I was professionally investing in 1981. So having seen these cycles, I, I can tell you, this is a bubble that's burst and it's going to get a lot worse. And so in my view, bonds are at enormous risk. And so, you know, to me, the people who are buying the 10 year here and, and driving that 60 bip decrease, I mean, they're picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. And frankly, I think stocks are at risk too, although they're a little bit better inflation hedge than, um, than, than, um, uh, than the bonds. So how do we deal with this? I mean, to me, the answer is obvious and I'm sure your audience knows this, right? The solution is gold. Gold is money that can't be printed. It's been money for 5,000 years. And, you know, basically when, when all the shit hits the fan and it will, and we'll talk about that timing if you like in a few moments, when all of that shit hits the fan, gold is the thing that's going to be left standing. And so here you can see, this is a fabulous chart. You know, gold is a percentage of global international reserves, basically what countries have held to protect their currencies from 1880 to present. You can see back in, you know, the gold standard days, it was 90%, 80-90%. And that started to fall post-World War II, but it was still up there fairly high. And then, of course, when we went off the gold standard, that was the beginning of the end. And, of course, gold price rallied a lot, brought it back up. But now look at where we are. And we're finally starting to upturn. And this is the same chart in Tavi's, Tavi's calculation of it. Notice how you know, we've got a nice rounded bottom and it's starting to increase. And I would submit to you that central banks see it coming. And this is, this is a Ronnie exactly. Stouffer. Yeah, this is a Ronnie Stouffer chart. And he's, he's brilliant too. And their work they do at, at Incrementum is just fabulous stuff. I use it all the time. And as I say, I'm not that good an analyst, but I stand on the shoulders of these guys. <laughs> And take a look at this. I mean, this is this is the net purchases of central banks. And notice how during the 80s, you know, they were sellers. It's like, ah, who needs gold? I mean, as you recall, Britain sold all their gold. Canada sold all their gold. Nobody needed it. We live in a deflationary world. You don't need gold. Somewhere along the line, that changed. People saw with 08, and, and if you notice, it actually happens to kind of correspond with 08, which is when I got really radicalized for sound money. I mean, We've been, Danielle, we've been running an enormous experiment since 08. I mean, the notion of ZERP, of having 0% interest rates, it's like a crime against capitalism. We had 0% interest rates from 08 to 2015. Then they started to bring them up. Then they had to cut them again in 18. Then they really cut them in 2020. And now, of course, they jacked them very high. But the point is, you know, the central banks and other countries realize what the U.S. is doing, which is debasing its currency. And that's why... You see this trend in gold purchases, and we were at an all-time high last year. And I think this year we're set to exceed the all-time high as well. And that's so, why we always say, do see what they're doing. You know, don't listen to what they're saying. Right. The exactly. complete opposite. But do and another another way of looking at it is just this set of charts. I mean, Luke Groman did this, and he basically pins it at, at Q4 of 2014 is really when kind of the worm turned, and they stopped buying U.S. Treasuries and they started buying gold. And so you can see since that period in time. You know, U.S. Treasury holdings worldwide by other countries is down 444 billion, and gold holdings in the same period of time are up 816 billion. And I would submit that's only going to continue. And so gold's been just bumping up against its all-time high, and we've now had kind of a triple top. This could be a quadruple, but there really is no such thing as triple tops. And to me, it's just a matter of time until gold breaks up and goes. I think we squirt to 2,500 easily, eventually 3,000, and you know, I mean, it's, eventually it's got to be 5, 10, 15. 20 if we do a monetary reset if we covered the entire monetary base with gold today the math is you'd have to be at an eighty-seven thousand dollar an ounce gold price now that's not going to happen but it gives you a sense of how much money we have printed paper money we printed in compared to how many ounces of gold there are in the world and and of course there's a lot of paper gold which is used to suppress the price okay another way of looking at the same kind of data is just and this goes back further all the way back to 84 this is a gold stock index compared to the price of gold 
And you can see that from 84 to really 08, you know, the ratio was kind of 0.2 to 0.35. We've plunged all the way down to 0.06. So we could actually triple the gold stock index and still be at the low end of the range. And what, as I tweeted this morning, you know, if the price of gold doubles and this reverts to the mean, you know, that's a six bagger. That's the two X price of gold doubling and this reverting to the mean is a three bagger. So two times three is six. So that means there's a 600% upside in some of these gold stocks. I truly believe that's the case, but you know, nobody cares. So um, that's really it on the gold side. Well, I want to thank you for sharing those charts. There's two points I want to make. So one, the, the, the debt, right? <clears throat> We're closing yeah. in on 34 trillion. I mean, I urge everyone to look at the U.S. debt uh, clock. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just something interesting. It's stunning, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's stunning is the word, exactly. Lawrence, let me ask you, because at what point you said, you know, we could talk about when the system breaks. I mean, I want, what, is the, what is the maximum debt level we can reach or, 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 <laughs> or deal with? We're going to find out, aren't we? <laughs> well, or, 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 like prices that we're seeing in everyday life, has the debt level become something that means nothing anymore? I mean, I think they're going to have to expand their balance sheet. When this... When this um, this tightening campaign ends and the economy really starts to feel the pain from these higher interest rates and layoffs, and suddenly inflation is no longer the problem, but deflation becomes a very serious risk, they are going to have to print until their eyes bleed. And I think that the, basically the Fed balance sheet isn't going to be, you know, the the nine or eight or seven trillion that it's aiming towards right now. It's going to have to go to twenty or twenty five if they want to keep this system going, and that's because you know they're. They've, they've created kind of this fugoid wave where each swing gets wider and more out of control. And, you know, they, they had to, I mean, we saw what they printed in 08. I mean, they went from 1 trillion to 3 trillion. It took them three years to do that. We saw what they printed in 2020. They went from 3 trillion to 8 trillion. It took them 18 months to do that, right? The next, guess what the next round is going to be? You know, they're going to, they're going to have to print a lot of goddamn money to keep the thing working. That's so, my belief. So, so my, the, the, the second part of my question is, let's talk central bank digital currencies because is oh, that yeah. part of the new monetary system for you? I mean, we saw the headline from the IMF. They're telling us now, like the IMF Absolutely. comes out and says there is no turning back. So when people are, are asking, do you think it's a reality? No, this is already in place. There's, there's, yeah. there's countries who already have it in place. Pilot projects, 180, 190 countries now. So, yeah. well, a hundred percent. There's just so, no that. There's no doubt that's where they're going. But so going. if if we do roll into central bank digital currencies, what happens to that that debt? Well, I mean, what 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 I think they will do, what what they're going to have to do to keep things from blowing up is they're going to have to become the buyers of that debt, and they're going to have to in, invoke yield curve control because otherwise interest rates are going to go higher and higher, and it's going to be a death spiral, and 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 so. My sense is that they will do that. They will, they will for you know, and and they will try all kinds of draconian measures. I mean, they they may force people in the U.S. who have IRAs and four hundred one k's to buy government bonds. They may, you know, tax people who hold gold and Bitcoin. Um, they may, um, you know, they, they know that they're they're not all stupid. Some of them are, but they're not all stupid, and they know what's coming. And so, um, you know, they're going to use the CBDC to to in, in, implement uh, UBI. I mean, hell, they, they they tested UBI in you know in COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. they you know, and so they're they're likely to to use you know okay. And everyone's gonna say, well, I don't want a CBDC. Well, if you're poor and you can't buy food, and they're giving you a CBDC, and that's the way you get your money to buy your food. Guess what? You're gonna take a CBDC. You know, now I'm not gonna hold. If if they give me anything in a CBDC, I'm gonna instantly swap it out for, you know, something that's real. But, you know, the average human being might not do that. And by the way, they might prevent me from doing that. They might say, here's, a, here's your CBDC payment and you can only use it for food or whatever it might be. But, you know, they've, they've got a lot of levers. And, and really, Danielle, it's so far gone that, that I don't think there's any way they can come out of this. But I will say, when people ask about investing in my funds, they, say, they ask me what could go wrong. And I will tell you what could go wrong. And you'll laugh and they do too. But what could go wrong is if suddenly the U.S. federal government got incredibly responsible and decided to means test Social Security, means test Medicare, cut all these military bases, cut military spending, balance the budget, have a balanced budget amendment, and or maybe do some kind of a monetary reset like Roosevelt did, you know, to, to, 
to, to gold or something sound or a basket of commodities, you know, that might stop the incipient high inflation problem that I believe is baked into the cake. But when I tell people that, they kind of smile knowingly, just as you did, like, what are the odds of that, right? I mean, uh, these people are idiots. The odds that they do that are not very high, right? Or at well, least we feel more pain. That'd be my sense. Exactly. Well, this brings me to my next point, uh, feeling yeah. pain. Um, and it's also uh, something we talk about uh, a lot about over here at ITM is that we warn about pattern shifts, right? And, and I know you alluded to that. And that's what we have to pay attention to. But now 60% of Americans uh, are living paycheck to paycheck, even though we see the robust reports, you know, from Black Friday, from Cyber Monday. Uh, but couple this with a news headline I saw. I saw the actually the CEO of uh, the, one of the largest grocery supermarket chains, uh, you know, Kroger, uh, cutting guidance, Lawrence, citing pressure on the consumer, customers on a budget. Perhaps they're still buying, you know, the, the televisions or, or the clothing, but the average American is suffering when it comes to buy basic things and necessities like food. Yeah, don't get me started. It is it is absolutely incredibly sad and tragic what's happening to the middle and working class of this country because their costs are going up relentlessly and their salaries aren't keeping pace. And you know, so many of these numbers, I mean, yeah, Walmart guided lower, they, you know, they're all guiding lower. And, and you actually see nominal increases. I mean, maybe we get a 4.9% GDP print, but that's yeah. because inflation is running at 12%. So people are buying less stuff. It's just that the, the, the fact that the prices have gone up so much that gets reflected in the GDP print. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's absolutely tragic what's going on. And, you know, it's all because of the broken money. And what you don't, what sadly what we don't see enough of, I mean, I look at CNBC or so many of these news outlets, not yours, but so many of these other ones, and nobody's focusing on the real core issue, which is, you know, the government spending is out of control and the monetary system is terribly exactly. broken, you know? Exactly. It, and, 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 cool. and I, and I, sorry, please. Go ahead. That's it. No, that's no, it. No, I was going to say, and I, I like the fact that on, you know, anyone who follows you on Twitter, Lawrence, you speak about the toll on mental health that this oh, yeah. is taking and, and, and how you say at the root of it is this broken money system. Yeah. So another headline, Americans need an extra $11,000, 11,400 just to afford the basics. I mean, you know, I'm, look at my Twitter thread, Luke Roman passed along a yeah. Twitter thread. I mean, uh, suicides in the US last year, record levels, record levels of suicides. I mean, that's, that's economic despair. That's a guy in the Midwest whose job got shipped over to China. Yeah. And he, you know, and he can't find a working wage to pay his salary. He's ashamed of himself. And he decides, fuck it, I'm just going to kill myself. I mean, this is fucking tragic. It's really awful. It's absolutely awful. And, you know, I'm just screaming from the rooftops. And sometimes I think I'm crazy. And people, you know, a lot of people, my friends say, hey, you know, you're going too far. But I don't really think there is a too far on this. I mean, to me, this is really life and death shit. I mean, if we don't fix this problem, there's going to be a lot of pain in this country. There's already a lot of pain. It's going to get worse. And so, you know, I'm, of an, op I'm an optimist. I mean, people, other people say, well, you're a doom monger. You're doing, you know, no, 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 I'm not. I'm the guy, I'm the weatherman. I'm sitting on the beach and I've got the, the, the tools to see that there's this enormous hurricane coming. And I'm saying, hey, guys, there's this fucking hurricane coming. Let's get out of the way so we don't get killed. And so, you know, and, and to me, I'm very optimistic because on the other side of this, it could be really good. I mean, if we return to a sound money system, if you look at the people and the technology, if we don't get into a shooting right. war, this it would be a beautiful world on sound money. And I, I've studied hyperinflation. Let me just finish one last thought. I've studied hyperinflations around the world. They're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. The misery and pain they cause is enormous. I mean, the German one is what led to them electing Hitler, and we know how that ended. So, but... On the other side of hyperinflation, if you return to sound money, things get better fast. And so, again, I, I pound the table for we've got to be writing our Congress people, writing our senators, voting for people who believe in sound money, voting pe for people who understand the issue. I mean, you know, RFK Jr. is not a perfect candidate. He's got some flaws in my view. But of all the candidates running, he's the only one that understands that this is the biggest this is a big problem. And so for that reason, over the others, because I think this is the biggest problem that the country faces, I support it. I mean, I know we threw a lot of uh, stuff, <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, very depressing news headlines and, and charts yeah, on people. It, but it, I think, the so yeah. no, I, I know, but I know that 
part of at the heart of what you do, the root of, you know, you want to educate people, right? So I know right. you believe that, you know, be prepared and let's just face with, let's face what's coming. Right, exactly. If the storm is coming, let's figure out how to weather the storm and let's fight to make the system better because, you know, I don't want my kids and my grandkids to live in a, I don't have grandkids yet, but I hope I will soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, my wife is really hoping we will soon. <laughs> Oh, I don't want I don't want them to live in a world that looks the way it looks right yeah. now, because, you know, I grew up in the 70s and this country wasn't perfect then. And I watched you know people go off to the Vietnam War and the country was screwed up in a lot of ways back then. But it was a kinder, gentler America back then. It really was. I mean, this is this is really this is socialism for the rich and rugged capitalism for everybody else. And everybody else is hurting. And it's time we level the playing field, you know. I feel like I feel like I need to bring you back another time because this is a whole other topic of why yeah. Wall Street wants people. And I, I mentioned Wall Street because obviously Buffett, Munger, you know, personal personifications of Wall Street, of why they want you to hate gold so badly. Well, they can't make any money off it. it, it that's a, that, that's the reason they can't make any money off it. I mean, they've got they've got a really good grift going on based on selling you paper that they can create an infinite supply of. And um, if you leave that system, if you exit yeah. their system, exactly. you basically are taking money out of their pocket exactly. and, they, and they know it. And, that, and, that's, and they've been fighting it for years as a result of it. I mean, Volcker said it in his memoirs. He said the only mistake they made in the 70s was not suppressing the gold price more. You know, they, they, know, the, they know the deal. So you're either on the side of, of honest and, and hardworking people and you want sound money or you're not. And in my view, you know, all the private equity guys, most of the Wall Street guys, CNBC, you know, uh, Buffett, Munger, all these guys, they're all they're all basically uh, crooks. You know, they're 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 talking their own book, just as I'm talking my own book. But my own book is, <laughs> my own book is but, but I will say something. My own book is something that was talked about in the Bible, which is honest weights and measures. And so, you know, gold and silver represent honest weights and measures and, um, you know, always have and always will. And uh, that's the kind of money I intend to hold. And I think everyone should hold. Lawrence, I appreciate you giving us your time today and coming uh, with an excellent, thorough presentation. I'm sure uh, many folks will absolutely appreciate that. Probably rewatch this interview twice, if not three times. So <laughs> thank you, Lawrence. Well, I, you know, look, I would just caution everybody. Um, I don't always have it right. My timing's not always right. I don't know everything, but I do have a point of view. And I would say everybody needs to have some of what I've got. Or some of what I'm sorry, they're mowing my I lawn. I hope they're not coming to get you. I thought it was yeah, choppers, right. Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, no, no. My, my, my lawn is getting mowed. But since everybody needs to have some sound money in their portfolio. I had ended on that. Have some sound money. Lawrence Lepard, thank you so much. And thank you all for watching the Daniela Camboni Show. We'll have more great content coming your way. So don't forget to sign up at DanielaCamboni.com. That's it for me. We'll see you soon.